Some people say that a FP way of doing things is easier, while others think it's more complicated and it's not even worth it. So let's explore this. To not go too abstract, we can anchor ourselves around one concept, iterating over data structures, loops, recursions, and other alternatives. And at the end, I'll walk through solving a little interviewing task to tie it all together. I assume you know what a loop is. Loop is a fundamental concept in imperative programming. Here's a typical for loop in JavaScript. Note that we'll keep switching languages later. This code prints numbers from 0 to 5. Then there is a recursion, which is less popular among programmers, but nevertheless fundamental in math, computer science, and everywhere else. Both of them can be used to solve simple problems. So which one is better? What if we look at an example? Here's a simple problem. Given an object that has an items field and an optional parent, write a function that searches for a needle first among its items, and if it's not there, searches the parent. In other words, this is expected results. So when we search for 40 and item says 40, it returns 40. If it searches for 40 and the parent has 40, then it returns 40. If it searches for 40 and then the grandparent has a 40, it also returns a 40. And if none of the scopes or parents have it, it returns null. And if the search feels useless, imagine it's searching for a whole object by name or something. We can write this using two for loops. The outer loop, we start with the current scope and visit all parents while they exist. The inner loop, we start with the zero index and we go through all the items by index. We break from all the loops as soon as we find a desired object, otherwise we return now. Alternatively, we can write this using recursion. Here I'll only turn the outer loop into recursion. If the inner loop stays the same, we still go through all the items in the scope. While the recursion is this, if we didn't find the object and the parent exists, we rerun the function for the parent. Otherwise, we return null. So both of these work, but there is no punchline yet. Even if you're new to functional programming scene, somebody has probably tried to convince you how superior it is. The recursion and function programming in general. How easy and powerful some FP concepts are compared to the alternatives. And if you already have some experience with functional programming, you might be guilty of this yourself. It happens to us constantly. Some concept just clicks and we wanna go and share it with everybody else because it made our life so much better. To a newcomer or bystander, it's not as apparent. Why would this alien functional concept be any better? It's common to hear, oh, I've been doing X for years and it's okay, why would I even relearn for no reason? And then we have a stalemate. I have a hunch that it's mainly to miscommunication or misperception and hurdles of trying a new concept. First quick spoiler, loops and recursions aren't actually rivals. As I'll show later, there are different kinds of loops and various other ways to iterate. Second, hurdles such as intuition and ease can make it challenging to try a new concept. It may not immediately make sense when we encounter a new way of doing things. But we should not expect to intuitively grasp ideas. Some concepts can be easier to understand and require little effort, while others may be more complex and require more time. Let's go back to iterations. Let's examine the basic for loop and recursion, then look at what people really do in production these days. Note that there are many different ways to iterate over data structure. For loops, recursions, iterators, least comprehensions, different combinators, operators, pipelines, while loops, etc. We've already seen loops. This time let's ask ourselves what decisions we must make when writing a for loop. First, where do we start? In this case, i is zero and sum is zero. Why do we stop? In this case, we go until the numbers length, till the end. How to iterate or what is the step? In this case, we bump index by one. What to do on each step? In this case, add the current number to the sum. And for now, let's pretend like we don't have to worry about the outside state and the state of the world. So at least four decisions for a for loop. Okay, what about recursion? First quick recap. Recursive function comprises two parts, the base and the recursive case. The base case is a condition to stop the recursion and the recursive case is where the function calls itself. So what is the best case? In this case, if the list is empty, return zero. What is the recursive case? In this case, at the current number, to the sum of the rest of the number. Additionally, we can ask what is the initial input to the recursive function. In this case, we pass numbers intact, but sometimes we need to adopt the given data. For example, reverse the input list or pass some accumulator. We'll see you later. Seems like we have to make fewer decisions using recursion, but this is neither interesting nor really crucial. The crucial part is the nature of the decisions. Notice that we move from how to do things to what to do. We don't worry about how the code runs, where to start, 
where to end, how to iterate. We specify what we want to achieve. And this is the shift we have to do. And this is the property that functional programmers prefer. But this property is not only tied to recursions. Let's see what languages offer these days. Rust, for instance, has a more concise for loop alternative. Here's a way to sum numbers. And the same as Scala, we can use for loop or for comprehension to sum numbers. Moreover, we can add some transformation and filtering. For example, to sum the square of positive numbers. Filter to get only the positive numbers, and then we square them and add it to the sum. These concepts are more functional than the JavaScript loops we started with. We don't worry about how the code runs. Also, in both languages, this is a synthetic sugar for functions or operators, or combinators, or pipelines, or methods, or whatever you want to call it. Rust for loop syntax is synthetic sugar for iterators, which are responsible for the logic of iterating over some items. Scala for comprehension is synthetic sugar for a sequence of calls to these methods, for each map, flat map, and with filter, which can be used on any types that define these methods. So, this and other function can often be directly used to achieve the same results more concisely. For example, we can rewrite the same in Rust and similar in Scala. We say filter this out, query the numbers, and then sum them up. We don't worry about the type of the collection, how many elements it has, how to traverse it, etc. So let's do a practical walkthrough. I'll show you how I usually go about solving a problem using recursion. Imagine we have a problem. We have a list of responses from different services. Each response is either a successful number or a failure message. We need to return one result, either a list of all successful numbers if there are no failures or the message of the first failure. Each result is represented by the either type, like result in Rust. Right represents success and contains a value, in our case, a number. And left represents failure and contains an error value, in our case, error message. These are the example inputs and outputs. If all the responses are successful, the result should be right of list 12582. If there is at least one error, then the result should be left boom, which is the first error. It is given that our function should return either error message or a list of ints. What's next? We start with this question. What is the initial input to the recursive function? Do we need all the elements? Yes, there is no way around it. We need to process the results. And do we need anything else? Um, here's a reminder. If there is an error, we return the element right away. If there are no errors, we must accumulate, in other words, keep track of, all the successful values. So while going through the results, we have to accumulate some values. We start with an empty list, and when we see a successful one, we're gonna append it to the list. This is not the finest interface. Users should not deal with the internal accumulators. We can wrap it up like a candy or a sausage and expose only what's needed. Also, let's reorder to make a nicer visual hierarchy. So this one is a public function and this one is internal recursive function. And this pattern is quite common. You can look it up, it's called recursive go. Now we have to think about the recursion. We recurse over a list. A list is either empty or nil in Scala or has elements. Additionally, we can split a list as a head, first element, and a tail, the rest of the elements. So what is the best case? The recursion stops when the list ends, or doesn't even begin, when the list is empty. It means there are no errors and we return success. Accumulator should contain all the successful values. If the original list is empty, accumulator is empty, otherwise accumulator contains all the numbers. Success. And what is the recursive case? On every step we have to decide what to do with the head, a tail, and calling the recursion. What is the head? It contains a current value, which is either a successful number or a failure message. Let's make it explicit. So the first option is the left of a failure message, and the second option is right of the successful result number. If we're looking at a failure, that's it, we're done. And we can just return it. We don't care about the rest of the list and accumulate values. And if it's a successful value, we add it to the accumulator. We have to keep the recursion going because we have to iterate through the rest of the list. We call the go function again, but this time the input is the rest of the list and accumulator contains another successful value. And that's it, let's test it. Here's a response success. It had only the successful values. If we try to process it, we get back a successful value with the list 
of all the responses as expected. And here's the response failure. It has one failure, which is boom. And if we try to process it, we get back this failure with the message boom. Oh, remember we talked about alternatives? We can refactor our process using a standard function called sequence. And, and that's it. There are no tricks or magic behind it. Here's the beauty and power of functional programming. It's also reusable and quite common. For example, you sent a multiple request and one service failed, you can just abort all the other operations and return the failure. You don't have to wait or waste resources. Same with accessing a database or parsing some data you got from the front end. And if we change the type, for instance, to optional values, we don't need to change the body. So final words. If you wrote thousands of loops, is writing a recursion for the first time going to be easy? No. Will it be very beneficial? Well, it depends on your goals. If you want to just impress your colleagues, then probably not. If you have some long-term plans and aim to expand your horizon, then perfect. After writing hundreds or maybe thousands of loops and recursions, do I prefer recursion to a loop? Yes, anytime. Do I prefer using a combinator or a nicer comprehension syntax? Yeah, most of the time. But recursion is still an excellent tool for some jobs. Tune in next time when I apologize for using else in this video.